At last, we've done it. We've done every quest, talked with every character, and found every piece of loot available in the Far Harbor DLC for Fallout 4. Now it's time to go over the spoils, most of which we covered during my series on the full story of Far Harbor, though some of the loot I had already covered before I started that series in previous videos. I'll include those videos in the Far Harbor playlist, but we'll still go over all of the loot here. We'll start with weapons. One of the new weapons introduced with Far Harbor is the Meat Hook. It's brand new to the DLC, but they're kind of hard to find. We can find some on the inventories of merchants and some lying around the world. One guaranteed spawn for the Meat Hook is inside the Old Pond House, a trapper den atop the kitchen table. It's an unarmed weapon. Before perks and other stats are considered, it does a base damage of 20, but it can be upgraded at a workbench to have extra hooks. These extra hooks increase its damage by 5, but also grant us a chance to disarm. Because it's an unarmed fist weapon, it can't be used in power armor. It's a medium speed weapon like the other fist weapons, and it's a pretty decent one before upgrading it. It has the same damage output as a power fist, and after upgrading it, it matches the damage output of a Deathclaw Gauntlet. But since my character is a power armor character, I didn't fare so well while using it. We find a legendary meat hook on the inventory of Ericsson, a super mutant merchant whom we find at Horizon Flight 1207. I covered him in a video that you can watch here. The Butcher's Hook comes with the Relentless Legendary Effect, which refills our action points on a critical hit. This can be a game-changing melee weapon for melee characters who use a lot of VATS perks, like Grim Reaper's Sprint and Critical Banker. It has the potential to allow a character to chain critical hits almost perpetually. Pretty great little weapon. Next up is the Lever Action Rifle. This is my personal favorite weapon that comes with the DLC, and probably the best legendary one we can walk away with is Old Reliable a two-shot legendary weapon that we can buy from Dajin at Acadia. It shoots an additional projectile. This is just an amazing weapon. It's the end game weapon for my Minuteman Sniper character, a character I've used in most of my older lore videos. So you've seen me use this weapon quite a lot. It's one of the best realized new weapons that came with Far Harbor. It has a number of amazing mods. It comes with many receiver options. It has four barrel options, short, long, short ported, and long ported. Three stock options, short, full, and marksman stock. I love the bullets we see there on the stock with the markman stock and a number of different sight options. And it has two muzzle options, a compensator, or a suppressor, and that suppressor is just cloth wrapped around the barrel. <laughs> I love it. This is the weapon I always wanted back when I first started playing Fallout 4. It's gorgeous, well made, has a brand new ammunition type, which is a bit rarer than I would like, and it just feels fun to hold and shoot. Now, it does come with a glitch. Every time we reload the weapon, it reloads the entire magazine, even if we've only fired one shot. This can be really annoying for a sniper, but thankfully there are free mods available that fix this issue. We find one more legendary lever action rifle, Lucky Eddie, which is the reward we get from Alan Lee if we agree to destroy Acadia with him. Lucky Eddie is a unique weapon with a completely unique legendary effect not found on any other weapon in the game. This legendary effect grants us plus two to luck, a potentially game-changing legendary effect for low luck character builds. Aside from the legendary effect, it looks and acts like every other lever action rifle. Next up is the pole hook a brand new two-handed melee weapon. We find a legendary one as soon as we arrive in Far Harbor, the Fish Catcher, sold by Alan Lee. It's a fish hook on a pole. Its legendary effect is that in VATS, it consumes 40% fewer action points. It has one upgrade at a weapon's workbench. It can be upgraded to puncturing. This adds three new hooks to the thing and grants it armor piercing and superior damage. This upgrade requires blacksmith too. 
This weapon is one of the most powerful melee weapons in the game. It's a slow melee weapon with a base damage before perks are considered of 86. That's the second highest damage for any blunt weapon in the entire game bested only by Sido's Shiny Slugger from the Nuka World DLC. Since it's such a slow weapon, its legendary effect which reduces AP cost is amazing. It does more damage than a regular pole hook, 86 compared to 63. It has the same speed as a sledgehammer, 40, but does more damage than a super sledge, nearly twice as much. Due to how easy it is to get this weapon, all you need is the money, it's really a must-have weapon for melee characters who like slow, blunt weapons. We find one more legendary pole hook given as the final quest reward by Cassie Dalton. The Bloodletter. Targets bleed for 25 points of additional damage. This one, however, has far less damage per attack than the Fish Catcher. It only has a base damage of 30, which is less than the base damage of a regular pole hook. This is, of course, offset by the Bloodletter's bleed damage, since bleed damage does stack. In longer melee engagements, this can become a devastating weapon. And the Bloodletter has all of the same upgrades as the Pole Hook, which is just one, the Puncturing Upgrade, which adds armor piercing and increases its damage by 15. So the Bloodletter is a pretty good weapon, a viable candidate for an endgame weapon. Next up is the Harpoon Gun. We'll likely get our first Harpoon Gun by completing the Mariner's Hull Breach quests. She rewards us with the Defender's Harpoon Gun. Ignores 30% of the target's damage and energy resistance. The Harpoon Gun is a big weapon and therefore takes advantage of the Heavy Gunner perk. The Harpoon Gun is a really interesting weapon because it deals an enormous amount of damage with a base damage of 150, which incidentally is the same as a missile launcher, and yet with many of the characteristics of a typical rifle. The projectiles are very high speed, much faster than missiles, but like a missile launcher, it has a very long reload speed, and it only fires one harpoon at a time, meaning we have to reload it after each use. It has an action point cost of 40, which is pretty good for a heavy weapon. Only the flamer, the junk jet, and the minigun have a smaller action point cost. But one of the best things about the harpoon gun is that the ammunition is often recoverable. It works a lot like a railway rifle, though the harpoons do travel faster than railway spikes. It can dismember enemies and pin their body parts to walls. It has a good selection of upgrades, many which change the functionality of the weapon. Instead of harpoons, we can upgrade the weapon's ammunition to flechettes. This basically turns it into a huge shotgun. Strangely enough, it still takes harpoons as ammunition, and even after firing flechettes, we can still recover harpoons from an enemy's corpse. But since it fires multiple flechettes, we can actually recover more than one harpoon off of an enemy body. Therefore, with this weapon, it's possible to actually gain ammunition while using it. Though, using the flechettes as ammunition reduces its projectile speed by about 25%. And we can upgrade it to a barbed harpoon. This adds bleed damage, but reduces the projectile speed. The barbed harpoon has about the same projectile speed as a railway rifle, which is about 50% of the speed of the regular harpoon. It also has two sights, a regular iron sight, for lack of a better word, and then a short scope. Look at this scope, it looks like a periscope. <laughs> I love the way this thing looks. It's a pretty interesting heavy weapon. It's a little awkward, slow to reload, but it's got great accuracy and it's enormously powerful. The legendary effect on this sucker is amazing, even allowing players who have not specced into Heavy Gunner to one-shot many enemies. We find another legendary harpoon gun on Alan Lee's inventory. He sells Admiral's Friend. This weapon does double damage if the target is at full health. A situationally useful legendary effect, mainly good for an initial hit on big enemies. We find another legendary harpoon gun by completing the Shipbreaker quest. This quest can be hard to find. I covered it in my video on Shipbreaker that you can watch here. But in that video, I didn't cover every dialogue option with Old Longfellow, and I missed a few things. 
The reason this quest is tricky to get is because it depends upon completing a number of quests for the people of Far Harbor and working on a number of settlements. Eventually, either a settler will walk up to us and give us this quest, or we randomly pick up a radio signal on our Pip-Boy called Shipbreaker's Radio Signal. I've also heard that Old Longfellow can personally give us this quest if we maximize affinity with him. However, I maximized affinity with him on two previous occasions, and he never personally gave me the quest. Once we get the quest, and once we listen to Shipbreaker's radio frequency, we can track down the Shipbreaker, much like we tracked down the Synth at Green Tech Genetics. Once we find him, we're in for one of the most difficult fights on the island. My Minuteman Sniper character was able to kill him in just a few shots. That's because I was using a two-shot Gauss rifle on my Sniper character who was over level 100 at the time. On my Commando character here, it took quite a while to kill him. Once we kill him, we can return to Longfellow. I hear that you've been trying for years to track down an ancient fog crawler. That's right. Shipbreaker, I call her. A wily old beast. I've put all the harbor men on the lookout for her. Why is tracking down this fog crawler so important to you? She's not like any ordinary beast. She's vicious and kills for no good reason. Don't know if it's the fog that did it, or just something twisted in her nature. But she ain't like anything I've faced before. By now, it's personal. She's hurt a lot of people on this island. I intend to be there when she finally goes down. I just killed Shipbreaker on my first try. You're not much of a hunter, are you? Ever heard of beginner's luck? <laughs> oh, hell. I don't begrudge you your pride. If you took down that monster, you earned it. I took care of Shipbreaker for you. Did you now? That's damned impressive. Especially for a mainlander. No need to worry about Shipbreaker anymore. She's dead. About damn time that monster met her end. Funny thing is, happy as I am that she's gone, I think I'm gonna miss her in a way. Walking in the fog will be a bit less interesting now. But I don't have to wonder if she might be lurking behind the next rock. Kept me on my toes, she did. For that, I'm grateful, in spite of the sorrow she visited on the island. Here, you may as well have my trusty old harpoon gun. I was saving it for delivering the killing blow to Shipbreaker. But now you should have it. As a reward he gives us, Skipper's Last Stand. This harpoon gun has the resilient legendary effect. It grants plus 150 damage resistance while reloading. Sadly, this legendary effect is also situationally useful, and that's due to the diminishing returns of damage resistance. For a character wearing no armor, while reloading this weapon, the legendary effect can reduce the damage we take by over 60%, but if we're wearing power armor, it only reduces about 7%. Next up is the Radium Rifle. One of the first radium rifles we're likely to get is Radical Conversion, given as a quest reward by Sister Mai at the Nucleus for completing the quest Ablusions. It ignores 30% of the target's damage and energy resistance. It's a 45 caliber carbine that has a completely new model and texture. The children appear to have taken the same technology that they used to create the Gamma Gun and attached it to this carbine. I suppose we can presume they found a cache of these carbines inside the nucleus, which they then retrofitted. Before perks and stats are considered, the Radium Rifle deals 27 ballistic damage and 50 radiation damage per shot. This makes the Radium Rifle a weapon that's useful in certain circumstances. It's not gonna be useful against enemies that are immune or resistant to radiation, like super mutants and ghouls, and many of the monsters we find here on the island. That makes the unique feature of this weapon, the radiation damage, essentially useless against half of the enemies we can encounter. However, against enemies that are susceptible to radiation damage like humans, this thing is devastating. 
particularly against legendary enemies. The radiation damage diminishes their max HP, reducing the amount of life that they can regenerate. It has a wide range of weapon modifications, but all of them are identical to those found with the combat rifle. The major difference is that since it has all of these scientific components attached to it, it requires higher levels of the gun nut and science perks in order to modify it. Additionally, since it deals radiation damage, this weapon benefits from the nuclear physicist perk. It's a flexible weapon that can be used as a long-range sniper rifle or even as an automatic weapon and the legendary effect on radical conversion is pretty great. Ignoring 30% of ballistic or energy damage resistance can even make it useful against enemies that are immune or resistant to radiation damage. We find another legendary radium rifle on the inventory of Brother Kane. He sells the Kiloton radium rifle. With the explosive legendary effect, bullets explode on impact doing 15 points of area effect damage. This is a wonderful alternative to Spray and Prey, sold by Cricket. Like Spray and Prey, the Kiloton Radium Rifle benefits from the Demolition Expert perk. That coupled with the radiation damage inherent with this weapon that benefits from the Nuclear Physicist perk makes the Kiloton Radium Rifle just a devastating weapon. Like all radium rifles, it's situational, but there's no creature immune to explosives damage, so you can really tear things apart with it. Next up is Adam's Judgment. Our reward for completing the Heretic quest given by Grand Zealot Richter inside the Nucleus. This is a unique super sledge with a legendary effect that deals 100 radiation damage. This is one of the most powerful melee weapons in the entire game, but since much of that damage takes the form of radiation, its usefulness is situational. It's a slow melee weapon that weighs 20 pounds and has a base damage of 40, exactly like a regular super sludge. And in that regard, it has all of the same upgrades as a regular super sludge. We can upgrade it with a heating coil and a stun pack. As a super sledge, it benefits from the Big Leagues perk, but with the plus 100 radiation damage legendary effect, it also benefits from the Nuclear Physicist perk. And it has a completely unique model, unlike any other weapon in the entire game. It appears as if the children of Adam have created this thing by taking apart four fusion cores and piping in the nuclear material from within each one into the inner workings of the super sledge. The metal ends of the fusion cores make up the impact surface of the super sledge and we see that it's been well used. The ends are cracked and oozing nuclear waste. Against enemies that are immune or resistant to radiation damage, it still packs a powerful punch, but against enemies that are susceptible to radiation like humans, there really is no equal. It's simply a devastating weapon. Speaking of Fallout 4 weapons that have been reimagined here on the island, next up is the Striker which I covered in my video on Beaver Creek Lanes that you can watch here. In short, the Striker is a modified Fat Man that, instead of launching mini-nukes, launches modified bowling balls. It comes with the Striker weapon modification that has a 50% chance to cripple the target's legs, which itself is kind of ironic considering the lore behind this weapon. You should watch my video on it for that. While reading the terminal near to where we find the striker inside Beaver Creek Lanes, we find a terminal entry labeled, That Was Close, that gives us the recipe that we need to craft the modified bowling balls, which this thing uses as ammunition. We can now go to any chemistry station and craft the modified bowling ball. Now we find four of these modified bowling balls right here next to the striker, so we can go right downstairs and take the thing for a spin. It's, uh, it's interesting. <laughs> the balls don't do a lot of rolling, which is counterintuitive. Sometimes they will roll and other times they just hit the ground and stick there. It took me a while to get my aim right, but I finally did knock down some of those pins. But the great thing about the striker is you can reuse the bowling balls over and over again. You have to run and go find them after you launch them. You basically have unlimited ammunition. Considering how rare and expensive many nukes are, this is a wonderful alternative to a big guns spec player who wants a big old fat man but can't find any mini nukes. 
Now, we find eight or so bowling balls in this bowling alley. We can then go back upstairs and conveniently for us, we find both a weapons workbench and a chemistry station. Now, taking a look at the modified bowling ball recipe in a chemistry station, we see that it requires acid and oil to manufacture. Now, I don't have any on my inventory, but this is the room where the modified bowling ball was invented, and sure enough, we find two vials of acid and two cans of oil. This gives us just enough to craft two modified bowling balls. The modified bowling balls show up in the ammo section of your inventory, and even though it makes absolutely no sense, thankfully, they have zero weight. But the bowling balls that these modified bowling balls are made from have eight weight each. So, it's unrealistic to have a stack of 40 or 50 bowling balls on your inventory at any given time, but at least it makes the weapon viable. The bowling balls, once modified, don't weigh anything, and they are reusable. Now, how about combat effectiveness? Well... I'm used to doing much more damage with just my regular Gatling laser and my missile launcher. Now, my Gatling laser is a two-shot Gatling laser, so it does more damage than typical. But it just seems to me that this doesn't do a whole lot of damage. Also, in a real combat scenario, it's tricky to find these bowling balls. You saw me shoot, what, four, four bowling balls or so, and I ran around this swamp and I managed to find two. That means that somewhere out here are two modified bowling balls that either sank or I just couldn't find. Now, against larger targets, it's a little bit better for some reason. I'm not sure why. This character is specced into big weapons, and this weapon benefits from the big weapons perk. I was able to use this striker bowling ball launcher against a Mirelurk Queen, and it did pretty decent damage. But that said... After I got out of vats, Kate was able to finish off 25% of this Mylert Queen's life with the simple Aeternus Gatling laser that I equipped on her. So, it's a fun weapon. I'm so glad that I have it, but I don't think I'm going to be using it as a practical everyday weapon in my regular gameplay. Still, for those who are extremely ammo efficient and ammo conscious, this is a wonderful weapon because the ammunition is reusable. A great place to go for more bowling balls is the General Atomics Galleria. In the Galleria, we find Back Alley Bowling, another bowling alley, and inside, you can loot 45 bowling balls. 45! Way more than we found at Beaver Creek. You can then take these back to your favorite faction's headquarters and use a chemistry station to turn them into modified bowling balls, getting some experience crafting and reducing the weight to zero. Now, the unique ability on the Striker is actually a weapon modification, which we can take off and attach to any other Fat Man, including legendary Fat Men. And here's a tip that I read from commenter Jack Dab in the comments of my video on Beaver Creek Lanes. If we take the Striker modification off and attach it to Big Boy, the two-shot Fat Man that we can buy from Arturo at Diamond City, we can then shoot two modified bowling balls for every one bowling ball in our inventory. This allows us to practically have infinite ammunition, because every time we use the weapon, we are generating a brand new modified bowling ball, which we can then go and collect. Probably an unintended feature of the Striker, but a welcome one nonetheless. Next, we find a legendary flamer on the inventory of Dajan in Acadia called Sergeant Ash. It has the kneecapper legendary effect, granting us a 20% chance to cripple a target's legs. As I'm sure you remember from Saugus, the flamer isn't exactly new to Fallout 4, so it has all of the same mods as a regular flamer, but this legendary effect on a flamer is stunning, since it rolls the 20% chance to cripple limbs for each attack, and since as a flamer, it shoots just a steady stream of flame, we trigger the legendary effect multiple times per battle. This gives us an almost guaranteed chance to cripple an enemy when using this sucker in combat. 
Here I am at the hotel using it against ghouls, and I'm just crippling them and stepping back and letting them hobble to me. <laughs> they can't even get to me. And the problem is that it does use flamer fuel, and it uses a lot of it, so we go through fuel really quickly. But still, great little weapon. Next up is the Harvester, a unique ripper that we find in the end of dungeon steamer trunk at Echo Lake Lumber Mill. Its legendary effect grants us a chance to stagger on hit. This is an incredible combination. As a ripper, the Harvester attacks incredibly fast. It only does a base damage of 9, but with a very fast attack speed, this gives us the opportunity to trigger the legendary effect multiple times against one enemy. With this weapon, we can lock certain enemies into a persistent state of stagger. We can upgrade the Harvester with the Blacksmith perk, and it has all the same mods as a regular Ripper, and we can increase our damage with the Sucker with the Big Leagues perk. For melee characters using fast weapons, this is pretty much an essential one. It's practically overpowered. Next up is a unique combat rifle that we find in the basement of the Vimpop factory called December's Child, with a one-of-a-kind legendary effect. It's lighter and uses 5.56 ammo with a 25% faster fire rate and a 15% faster reload speed. This is a very strange weapon. It's a combat rifle, and it has all of the same combat rifle modifications, but it uses 5.56 ammunition. However, because it uses combat rifle modifications, it can be modified to fire 38 caliber rounds or 308 caliber rounds, which removes its ability to fire 5.56 ammunition. And the legendary effect appears to be broken. It says that it has reduced weight, but December's Child weighs exactly the same as a regular combat rifle. It uses 5.56mm ammunition, which is supposed to be a higher caliber, more powerful ammunition, but December's Child has the same damage rating as just a regular, non-legendary combat rifle, despite using a completely different type of ammunition. Really, the only thing about December's Child that is better than a regular combat rifle is that it does shoot faster, but 556 ammunition is harder to come by than the 45 caliber ammunition a combat rifle typically uses. So sadly, the weapon really isn't worth it. Next up is Fence Buster, a unique baseball bat that we find while exploring Vault 118, which I covered in my video on the topic that you can watch here. Fence Buster comes with the Penetrating Legendary Effect, which ignores an enemy's ballistic and energy damage resistance by 30%. As a baseball bat, it has all of the same baseball bat modifications that the Commonwealth variety has, and we can add to it all of the new baseball bat modifications that come with the Nuka World DLC, as well as all of the Nuka World material options, allowing us to change its appearance. When fully upgraded, this can be a devastating weapon. 30% of an enemy's damage and energy resistances is nothing to sneeze at. I don't know if it's the best baseball bat to use, the 2076 World Series baseball bat is a lot more fun, and both Cito's Shiny Slugger and the Rockville Slugger have excellent legendary effects as well, so the usefulness of Fence Buster is dependent upon your character's build. That's it for unique weapons, but we do find other legendary weapons that are fixed rewards in the game. For example, by completing Chase's quest, The Arrival in Acadia, she rewards us with a Legendary Institute Rifle. The mods on this thing are randomized each time we get it, so we could abuse it by quick saving just before finishing the quest to get a weapon with the mods that we want, but it always comes with the same legendary effect, the Hitman's Legendary Effect, which is a brand new legendary effect that comes with Far Harbor. It grants plus 10% to damage while aiming. The weapon has all of the same mods as any other Institute weapon. I really want to like this thing because I love the way it looks. And as I'm playing on my Institute character, it would be a perfect match. But I find that the Institute weapons just burn through ammunition and don't pack as much of a punch. 
Then, also in Acadia, we can get a crippling sledgehammer as a reward for siding with Cog and choosing not to tell Jewel her true identity during the quest The Price of Memory. It does 50% more limb damage. It's basically just a normal sledgehammer with the crippling legendary effect. The one I got had the puncturing mod attached. One of the most exciting legendary weapons that we can get is the final quest reward for completing Close to Home. If we make the appropriate dialogue choices with Kasumi's father, we can dig up a supply stash that has a guaranteed legendary weapon drop. By quick saving just before digging this up, we can cycle through a number of randomly generated legendary weapons until we find the one we like. I did this a number of times to get the footage necessary to make this video. I found an instigating overcharged plasma sniper rifle, a dead-eye fiery laser rifle, a junkie's agitated improved automatic laser pistol, a never-ending powerful combat shotgun, an enraging agitated laser rifle, and a crippling overcharged plasma sniper rifle. Pretty cool selection. Finally, Far Harbor comes with four new traps that we can craft. We can also find these at certain locations throughout the world. We find some bear traps at the National Park Visitor Center and others at the Cliff's Edge Hotel. We can craft these at any chemistry station. First are the caltrops. It costs five steel to build these and they only do six damage, but they grant a chance to stagger an enemy. I don't think there are any perks that this particular weapon takes advantage of. Then there's the Bear Trap, which requires rank 1 of Blacksmith to craft, and costs 2 gear, 2 spring, and 4 steel. These do 34 damage before perks and character abilities are considered, and have a high chance to cripple legs. Then there are two upgraded versions of each of these, the Poisoned Caltrops, which require rank 1 of Chemist, do slightly more damage, and add poison damage. And finally there's the Bleeding Bear Trap which requires rank 2 of Blacksmith. Does the same amount of damage, but in addition to crippling legs, causes bleeding damage. We use these in the same way that we use placed explosives like mines. In this example, I'm peppering a road with a bunch of regular bear traps, bleeding bear traps, caltrops, and poisoned caltrops. We need to take particular care when placing something near to a bear trap that we've already placed, as we can trigger our own bear traps by placing other explosives or even other traps. Once a bear trap is triggered, it has a chance to break, thus wasting the bear trap, though sometimes once it's triggered we can go back and reuse it. I then generated a bunch of very weak fog ghouls, and this is what went down. Even against very weak enemies, the traps did slow them down, giving us an opportunity to retreat or prepare ourselves, but they did minimal damage, killing only a few of these very weak fog ghouls. To get this result, I put down 10 of each type of trap, so that was 40 traps I had in the roadway, and I didn't even kill 10 ghouls. I had to finish them off later. But the greatest drawback to these weapons are their weight. Each bundle of caltrops weighs half a pound. Each bear trap weighs eight pounds. So to get this result, I had to carry 170 pounds worth of traps. Most of that weight was with the bear traps. Because of this, I just can't see any of these traps being particularly efficient, especially when mines, which do much more damage, weigh the same as the caltrops, only half a pound. Therefore, I think these traps are situational for lower level characters who are stealthing around, strategizing before each encounter. They may be useful, but for characters like mine who tend to plow through enemies with pain train, not so much. And that's it for weapons that come with the Far Harbor DLC. Now, it's time to move on to new armor pieces. There are a plethora of completely new armor pieces that come with Far Harbor, most of which are not legendary and aren't found in any particular place. We'll start with some of the most powerful armor introduced with Far Harbor, the Marine Combat Armor. 
Marine combat armor is a pre-war armor that was used by servicemen at the Mount Desert Island Naval Facility. Servicemen who worked on and aboard the USS Democracy. The base was scheduled to receive new shipments of the armor, but the day the bombs dropped, the ships transporting that armor crashed and sank to the bottom of the sea. While exploring Dima's memories, we find out the location of these sunken shipments, and we can go and retrieve them. Doing so, we can collect every piece of pre-war marine combat armor. A full suit of pristine pre-war assault marine combat armor weighs a whopping 95 pounds, but grants 159 ballistic damage resistance and 158 energy damage resistance, as well as 60 radiation damage resistance, making it one of the best non-power armor suits of armor in the game. Now, the marine combat armor that was inside the nucleus when the bombs dropped has been degrading over the past 200 years, exposed to radiation and the elements, and so when the children of Adam moved into the nucleus, they found and adopted this slightly weaker Zealot's marine combat armor. The Zealot Marine Combat Armor has a completely different texture. The pre-war version of the armor has been modified by the Children of Adam, painted up with Children of Adam insignia, and due to its degradation over the years, it's a bit weaker. A full suit of Zealot's Marine Combat Armor weighs 59 pounds, grants only 108 ballistic damage resistance, and 108 energy damage resistance. Part of this is because there is no Zealot's Marine Armor Helmet. We only find an Assault Marine Armor Helmet. But even if we take the resistances from the helmet out of the equation, the Zealot suit is still an inferior suit compared to the Assault suit. However, the Zealot suit can be upgraded in an armor workbench to the Inquisitor suit of Marine Combat Armor. It looks exactly like the Zealot suit, but it has greatly improved resistances, matching that of the Assault Marine Armor. The only difference between a full suit of Assault Marine Armor with a helmet and Inquisitor Marine Armor with the helmet is where you want one point of damage or energy resistance. The Assault suit has 159 ballistic and 158 energy, the Inquisitor has 158 ballistic and 159 energy. With the helmet, both suits have 60 radiation damage resistance. In addition to the Assault suit that we can find underwater, and the Zealot armor that we can buy from Children of Adam merchants, we can find a few pieces of legendary Marine Combat armor. All of these legendary pieces of Marine Combat armor have the same stats as their non-legendary counterparts. The only thing that differs is their legendary effect. We find a Recon Marine right arm on the inventory of Sister Mai in the Nucleus, which has a legendary effect that increases the wearer's movement speed, by 10%. Then on the inventory of Brother Kane, we find the Recon Marine left arm, which has a legendary effect that temporarily slows time during combat when our health is at 20% or less. On the inventory of Cog at Acadia, we find the Recon Marine chest piece, which has a legendary effect that reduces damage while standing and not moving by 15%. Sadly, there are no Recon Marine legendary legs, but we do find a Recon Marine helmet sold by Brooks in Far Harbor. This helmet has a legendary effect that grants plus one to agility and one to perception. Finally, we can get a legendary marine combat armor chest piece from High Confessor Tectus either by siding with him and destroying Far Harbor or siding with Dima and working for peace on the island. He gives us Adam's Bulwark. Damage resistance and energy resistance increase with RADS. Specifically, our damage resistance and energy resistance increases by 5 for every 10% of our total health that is taken over by radiation. That means the total maximum benefit we can get from this piece of armor, if 90% of our health is eaten up by RADS, is plus 45 to damage resistance and energy resistance. Incidentally, this doesn't always drop as a chest piece. If our character is below level 40, it more often spawns as either a left or right arm. We are more likely to get the chest piece if we complete the quest after level 40. It drops with the Zealot armor mod attached, but we can upgrade it at any armor workbench to either the Inquisitor or the Assault mod. 
In one of the sunken shipments, we also find a marine wetsuit and a marine tactical helmet. The wetsuit is designed to be worn beneath the marine combat armor. According to a loading screen, this wetsuit was designed for nighttime reconnaissance operations. It has a ballistic damage and energy resistance of 5, and a radiation resistance of 5. Not terribly exciting, but it looks great. It comes with the marine tactical helmet, which counterintuitively has double the resistances of the suit itself. 10 ballistic and energy damage resistance and 10 radiation resistance. The entire suit can be worn under the marine combat armor, much like the vault suit can be worn under much of the Commonwealth's armor. However, frustratingly, it cannot be upgraded with ballistic weave. What a tragedy. Because of this limitation, the marine wetsuit looks amazing, but sadly, there are more practical options. When not wearing their marine combat armor, the Children of Adam wear the same Child of Adam robes and rags that their counterparts in the Commonwealth wear. They sell these outfits, and we get one for free while doing a quest for Zealot Wear. But we do find a unique version of these robes when we are first granted admittance to the Nucleus. The Robes of Adam's Devoted. This outfit covers all armor slots except for the helmet and the face, and it looks very similar to most of the other Child of Adam costumes we've seen so far. It's a dirty and ragged outfit, and a colander painted with Children of Adam insignia is affixed to the chest, apparently as some sort of primitive armor, with a bunch of coiled wires, and perhaps that's plant tendrils? The stats are not terribly impressive. It has a DR of 25, no energy damage resistance, and a radiation damage resistance of only 5. However, it can be imbued with Ballistic Weave. And in fact, many of the Children of Adam outfits we find here on the island can also be upgraded with Ballistic Weave making a Child of Adam playthrough a viable alternative. Next, we can get a very unique Child of Adam helmet by completing the quest Witch Hunt for High Confessor Tectus. It's called the Inquisitor's Cowl. The wearer's intelligence increases with radiation. It only provides a damage resist of two, and it covers our entire face, so we can't wear masks or glasses with it. The legendary effect grants us plus one intelligence for every 100 rads we're dosed with, but the bonus maxes out at plus four to intelligence. Even if we take more radiation damage, we can't get more than a plus four bonus. But the best thing about it is how it looks. This is one of the coolest looking helmets in the entire game. It appears to be made out of a colander, gas mask, goggles, and vehicle exhaust tailpipes. It's a great little piece. High Confessor Tectus wears a completely unique suit of armor that we can loot from him. The High Confessor's Helm and the High Confessor's Robes. The High Confessor's Robes, before perks and other character attributes are considered, has a DR and ER of 22 and grants plus 2 to endurance. But unlike the other Child of Adam clothing, it cannot be upgraded with Ballistic Weave. It looks just like the Child of Adam long rags, however it appears to be made out of leather instead of cloth. And instead of a colander affixed to the chest with a bunch of wires wrapped around the body, it has this weird copper grill, or maybe it was a heat sink of some sort from the submarine, hung around the neck that has developed a bit of a green patina. The High Confessor's Helm has a DR and ER of 4, but sadly the hat cannot be upgraded with Ballistic Weave. Far Harbor adds a slew of new fisherman-themed clothing pieces to the game. First, there are the Fisherman's Overalls, which come in five variations. All of these overalls have the exact same stats, zero damage and energy resistance, but plus one to endurance and each suit weighs three pounds. The regular fisherman's overalls looks a lot like the black and gray fisherman's overalls. The differences between them are the colors. The regular fisherman's overalls is green, the black one is black, and the gray one is uh, actually a kind of tannish color. Well, the chunky sweater beneath it looks gray, but the overalls themselves look tan. Then there are the brown and green fishermen's outfits, which share a completely different model. The only difference between the two are the colors. 
brown and green. Sadly, none of these overalls accept Ballistic Weave. There is a legendary version of this outfit that we get from the Mariner by completing her quest called The Legend of the Harbor. This is a legendary outfit that reduces damage from Mirelurks and Bugs by 15%. It looks like a plaid shirt with waders and suspenders. It takes up all armor item slots except for the head. But the best thing about this is that it does accept Ballistic Weave, making Legend of the Harbor a viable armor outfit for non-power armor characters. Though, you do get Ballistic Weave from the railroad, and as this is my Institute character, well, looks like I'll be sticking with my power armor. Far Harbor comes with three new fisherman-themed hats. There's the fisherman's hat, which grants zero DR and ER, but grants plus two to radiation resistance. It also grants plus one to perception. Then there's the old fisherman's hat, which grants plus two to DR, zero to ER, and plus two to radiation resistance. It also grants plus one to perception. And finally, there's the wool fisherman's cap, which grants plus one to DR, zero to ER, but plus five to radiation resistance. It also grants plus one to perception. We don't find any legendary versions of these hats, but we do get a unique hat by completing the captain's dance. It's called the captain's hat. It's a completely unique tricorn hat that increases the wearer's movement speed by 10%. It grants plus two to ballistic and energy resistance, and best of all, gives us plus two to intelligence. But sadly, it does not accept ballistic weave. It's a great alternative to the tricorn hat worn by John Hancock, which only grants plus one to charisma, and the Miniman General's hat, which also only grants plus one to charisma that makes this the best tricorn hat in the entire game. We actually find another tricorn hat here on the island called the Pirate Hat, and we can find two copies of this hat. One is worn by a teddy bear on a barge by a blue crate at the MS Azalea, and one is in a display case inside Vault 118. But their stats are much more disappointing compared to the captain's hat. They have zero DR and ER, and only plus one to charisma. Speaking of hats, we also find the Dapper Gent. We find the Dapper Gent on the inventory of Pearl, a merchant Mrs. Nanny inside Vault 118. The Dapper Gent grants plus 14 to DR, plus 12 to ER, plus 2 to Charisma, and reduces damage from robots by 15%. Finally, to wrap up the fisherman-themed suite of armors, the last piece comes from Old Longfellow. If we take Longfellow on as a companion, we can trade with him. And if we trade some new clothing with him, we can instruct him to equip it. And if he does, he takes off his Hunter's Long Coat, which we can then loot and use ourselves. The Hunter's Long Coat is an all-body piece of clothing, covering everything except for the face and head. So sadly, we can't wear armor over it. It has a base damage resistance of 40, grants two radiation resistance, and grants us one perception. But the best thing about the Hunter's Long Coat is we can upgrade it with Ballistic Weave. It is a handsome long coat, one of the best looking pieces of clothing in the entire DLC. So even if we don't want to run with old Longfellow, it's good to snag him as a companion just so we can take his coat. Next, the Trappers, the raider-like enemies we find with this DLC, have their own collection of completely unique armors. First, there's the Coastal Armor, which acts a lot like caged armor from the Commonwealth. It's a beautiful all-one-piece suit of armor with a DR and ER of 21. It weighs 15 pounds and has no radiation resistance. Then there's the Hunter's Pelt outfit, again acting a lot like caged armor. It's a full body suit that grants plus 15 DR and ER and weighs 15 pounds.
Then there's the Trapper armor, which acts a lot like the Raider armor from the Commonwealth. Like the Raider armor, the Trapper armor has an under armor that goes along with it called the Trapper Leathers. These work a lot like Raider Leathers from the Commonwealth. The Trapper Leathers have a DR of 2 and no energy resistance or radiation resistance. And like Raider Leathers, they do not accept Ballistic Weave. On top of this, the Trappers wear Trapper Armor. This Trapper Armor was originally designed to come with a matching helmet, but the matching helmet was cut from the game, and so Trappers are likely to wear a hat or a lobster helmet along with it. Like the Raider Armor in the Commonwealth, the Trapper Armor can drop at different qualities, but unlike Raider Armor, which has three qualities, Standard, Sturdy, and Heavy, the Trapper Armor only has two qualities, Standard and Heavy. It doesn't have a sturdy variant. A full suit of standard Trapper armor grants 56 damage resistance, 54 energy resistance, and weighs 41 pounds. A full suit of heavy Trapper armor grants 80 damage resistance, 80 energy resistance, and weighs 57 pounds. Neither version of the armor has any radiation resistance. Finally, the Trappers have their own headgear as well. First up is the Hunter's Hood, which is supposed to be worn alongside the all-body suits of Trapper armor, like the Hunter's Pelt outfit. The Trapper's Hood has a DR of 2, and that's it. And finally, there's the Lobster Trap Helmet, which I think is a really creative piece of headgear. I think this is supposed to be worn alongside the Trapper armor, since they cut the Trapper helmet. The Lobster Trap Helmet has a DR of 5. And that's it. No energy or radiation resistance. Next up is the Vault 118 Jumpsuit. We only find one of these in the game. Inside Vault 118, we find one on the receptionist's desk. It has the exact same stats and characteristics of every other Vault suit in the game, including the Vault 111 Jumpsuit. 0 DR, plus 5 to energy resistance, plus 10 to radiation resistance, and it can't be imbued with Ballistic Weave. But it has a 118 on the back. Then there's the Rescue Diver Suit, which we get as a quest reward from Captain Avery for completing the quest Changing Tide. Wearer gains ability to breathe underwater and protection from radiation. It grants plus 10 to ballistic and energy resistance and gives us a whopping 250 radiation resistance. But sadly, it can't be imbued with ballistic weave. Still, it's one of the best-looking outfits we find in Far Harbor. It's an old diving suit resembling standard diving dress that was used by underwater workers in the 19th and early 20th century. It's covered in a green patina, and it has a small window that does reveal our character's face. Partially. You can see my character's goggles. Oh, actually, it looks kind of creepy. Next, we can get the unique Courser uniform that Chase from Acadia wears. We could, of course, kill her. Or if we have maxed out Pickpocket, a Pickpocket skill of four, we can loot it off her inventory. It requires Pickpocket of four to loot something that someone is wearing. But if we loot it without being detected, we can wear Chase's uniform. It has many of the same statistics as a Courser's uniform, a damage resist of 30, energy resist of 15, and a radiation resist of 15. But it also grants plus one to endurance and plus one to perception. That makes it superior to all other Courser outfits. Sadly, we can't modify it further. It does not accept Ballistic Weave. But it's a wonderful little coat with years of wear and tear. The bottom hem is completely tattered, and it looks like it's been repaired in a number of places. A great little item for the collector. Next, there are two legendary synth chest pieces we can find in Far Harbor. The first is the final quest reward we get for agreeing to keep Dima's secret. He rewards us with Acadia's shield. This is a heavy synth chest piece that grants 39 damage resistance and 44 energy resistance, as well as plus one to agility, endurance, and intelligence. This is a clean version of the synth chest piece, unlike the dirty ones we find on synths in the Commonwealth. 
and the second one comes when completing the quest The Price of Memory by telling Jewel about her true identity instead of keeping it a secret for Cog. She gives us a key that we can use to unlock Jewel's lockbox in the basement of Acadia. Inside, we find a small stash of caps and ammunition and the unyielding synth chest piece. This is basically a heavy synth chest piece with the unyielding legendary effect, which incidentally is a new legendary effect to Far Harbor. It grants plus three to all stats, but only when we are at 25% or less health. Despite it being a common item with a new Far Harbor legendary effect, this piece is pretty rare and special because synth armor randomly drops either as standard, sturdy, or heavy. Once we get the piece in that condition, we can't upgrade it or downgrade it to any other type of armor. But this piece comes out of the box as a heavy version of the synth chest piece, and the legendary effect is pretty useful. Though its description is not quite accurate. It doesn't grant plus three to every stat. It grants plus three to every stat except endurance. If they buffed Endurance, it would mess with the mechanic that triggers this legendary effect. But still, even without the Endurance buff, it's a pretty useful effect. So in my opinion, this is a superior reward compared to the Sledgehammer. But of course, either of their desirability is based on your character's build. Finally, there are Power Armor paint jobs. Not exactly armor, but they go on armor. The first two are Vim-themed paint schemes that we can find on power armor already existing in the world or that we can unlock at a power armor station. We find one suit of armor with the Vim Refresh paint scheme on the bed of a transport truck on the road between Far Harbor and Dalton Farm. Then we find a red version of the paint scheme on a suit of T-51 power armor in the mixing vats area of the Vimpop factory. If we want to paint any suit of armor with these colors, we need to activate the nearby Vim Ambassador painting station terminal. Inside, we find a section called Vim Paint Job Schematics. Activating this adds two new paint options to our power armor workstation for the T-51 suit of power armor. The two new paint schemes are the same ones we've found on suits of power armor so far. This red paint scheme that we just found in the paint workshop, and the green refresh paint scheme, which we found on the suit in the back of the Vim Ambassador truck, the one being driven by Carlo. Both of these paint schemes are brand new to Far Harbor. They're gorgeous and filled with all sorts of wonderful little details. The final power armor paint scheme is kind of a Far Harbor thing, but not really. Each Brotherhood of Steel Knight rank has its own paint scheme, but not all of these were placed in the vanilla game. If we choose to side with the Brotherhood in Far Harbor and have them destroy Acadia, we get to meet Knight Captain Larson, who's wearing a suit of T-60 power armor painted with the Knight Captain Brotherhood of Steel rank insignia. If we really wanted it, this is our only opportunity to commandeer a suit of Night Captain painted power armor. And that's it for armor. Now to move on to perks. Far Harbor brings new levels to seven existing perks. Rank five of strong back, rank three of night person, rank four of rad resist, rank four of lone wanderer, rank three of scrapper, rank three of action boy or girl, and rank four of critical banker. But we also get some brand new perks from a variety of other sources. If we side with the children of Adam, we get the inquisitor of Adam perk which grants a bonus to weapon damage. The higher our rads, the greater the bonus. For every 100 rads we have, our weapon damage is increased by 10%. It works like the Bloody Mess perk, in that the perk only affects ballistic damage, pure radiation damage, and energy damage. It doesn't affect other types of damage we can do, like explosive damage. Incidentally, we only get Inquisitor of Adam if we chose to complete either the Witch Hunt quest or the Heretic quest aggressively by killing either Sister Aubert or Gwyneth. If we chose to resolve those two quests peacefully, we get the perk Crusader of Adam, but it has the exact same effects. If we side with the people of Far Harbor and blow up the Nucleus, we get the Far Harbor Survivalist perk which grants a bonus to all damage resistance types. 
Specifically, it gives us a plus five bonus to all damage resistance types, ballistic, energy, poison, and radiation. If we destroy Acadia with Alan Lee, we get the Destroyer of Acadia perk. When severely damaged, we receive a massive bonus to our damage output for 30 seconds. Specifically, this perk takes effect when our health drops below 20%. When it does, our damage output is multiplied by four times for 30 seconds. Note that we only get this perk by destroying Acadia with Alan Lee. If we do so with the Brotherhood or the Institute, we don't get the perk. If we work with Dima to achieve peace on the island, we get the Protector of Acadia perk. When severely damaged, there's a chance we'll receive a massive, but temporary, bonus to damage and energy resistance. Specifically, this perk triggers once our health goes below 20%, and when it does, we are granted with 1,000 damage and energy resistance for 30 seconds. This perk is a bit frustrating, as unlike with Nerd Rage, we don't get any visible indication when the perk activates. Time doesn't slow, our character doesn't say anything, we don't really know when it's happening. And it doesn't seem to happen every time. It only has a chance to trigger when our health is below 20%. We also find one new companion perk. If we maximize affinity with Old Longfellow, we get the Hunter's Wisdom perk. The damage resistance and energy resistance of animals and sea creatures is reduced by a whopping 25%. This is a good one to get early on during our exploits here on the island to maximize its use. The perk is particularly useful to get before fighting creatures like Shipbreaker, for example. Then there are five perk magazines we can find on the island, all of which have different benefits. While exploring the Northwood Ridge Quarry, if we head inside the interior cell, clear the place of trappers, and loot the end of dungeon steamer trunk, we find a side table next to it, on top of which is a copy of The Islander's Almanac, Pincer Dodge. You take 5% less damage from Mirelurk melee attacks. Oh, and I get it at the end of exploring Far Harbor. Typical. This would have been useful before exploring Haddock Cove. Then, if we head to Acadia, on the countertop next to Dejan, we find the next issue of Islander's Almanac, Children of Adam Exposé. We receive 10% less damage from radiation-based attacks. Then, while doing Cassie Dalton's quest, if we head to the Brookshead Lighthouse and scale the lighthouse all the way to the room at the top, we find the next issue of Islander's Almanac on a bookshelf next to a cooking stove. Precision Hunting. You have a 5% higher VATS chance against animals you are in combat with. Another good one to get early on during our exploits for VATS characters. Then, if we go to Far Harbor and head inside the last plank, we see that Old Longfellow was thumbing through a copy of the Islander's Almanac. Far Harbor Sightseer's Guide. This magazine adds new points of interest to our Pip-Boy map. Specifically, it adds the Cliff's Edge Hotel, Aldersea Day Spa, the Oceanarium, the Eden Meadow Cinema, Rayburn Point, Southwest Harbor, the Cranberry Island Bog, and the Old Pond House to our map. Even though we've already completed the primary story of this DLC, we have yet to explore some of these locations. Though I have done videos on some of them, like Eden Meadows Cinema, Rayburn Point, Southwest Harbor, the Cranberry Island Bog, and the Old Pond House. I'll cover all the others in upcoming episodes. Finally, if we head inside the gift shop at the National Park Visitor Center settlement, lying behind the front counter, we find a copy of Islander's Almanac Recipe Roundup. You've unlocked sludge-based recipes at the chemistry station. And this magazine gives us a great segue into our final segment of this video, New Consumables. This is the magazine I talked about in our second episode when I went over Condensed Fog. Condensed Fog is a new miscellaneous item that we can get from fog condensers. Once repaired, the fog condensers condense the nearby fog into a liquid, which it then drains out a pipe to the ground below. We can loot this liquid, which appears in our inventory as condensed fog. 
We have now unlocked four new recipes that all take condensed fog as an ingredient. The first is the Agile Sludge Pack, which increases action point regeneration compared to our current radiation level for 12 minutes. Then there's the Durable Sludge Pack, which increases damage resistance compared to our current radiation level for 12 minutes. Both of these are injectables like stim packs. The other two are beverages. The first is the Resilient Sludge Cocktail, which removes 150 rad resist, but grants us plus 75 to our maximum health for 12 minutes. And finally, there's the Strong Sludge Cocktail, which increases strength compared to our current radiation level for 12 minutes. These two look like big glass bottles with a cork inside. The substance within is murky. Doesn't really look appetizing. Next up is Fire Belly. We get the recipe for Fire Belly by completing Mitch's quest, The Holdout. Mitch's patented Fire Belly. One bottle of vodka, the cheap stuff will do. <laughs> These guys do like their vodka. Two bundles of black blood leaf, ground up, tossed in, whatever. A bit of aster for even extra kick. Drink! Stop if you start bleeding from the ears. Oh, this sounds lovely. We craft Fire Belly at a cooking station, not a chemistry station like the others. Fire Belly is an injectable, like some of the other sludge recipes we've unlocked. It takes away 30 HP every time we use it, but while under the effects of Fire Belly, our damage output gradually increases at low health. We see a recurring theme with many of the consumables from Far Harbor. Most of them are dependent upon our radiation exposure, and they're very situational. But I'm sure there are any number of character builds that can make good use of them. Next up is Mirelurk Jerky. We are likely to get our first strip of jerky from Old Longfellow when he's guiding us to Acadia. It heals 35 hit points, grants us plus 15 to poison resistance, and gives us temporarily a whopping plus 3 to perception. We can also craft this at any cooking station. To make one, it takes two pieces of Mirelurk meat, two tarberries, and one bottle of antifreeze. Ugh. Next up is Aster, which we can either use to craft with or turn into Aster, a new NPC whom we find at Acadia. She'll pay for each piece of Aster we give her. Aster is a new plant we find growing wild on the island. It's easy to miss though because it's really dark. We can eat it raw. It heals 10 hit points but doses us with two rads. But it's also an ingredient in three craftable consumables. Vim's Captain's Blend, if we get the recipe from the Vim bottling plant. Fire Belly, the recipe we already got from Mitch at the last plank, and Seasoned Rabbit Skewers. Yum. The Rabbit Skewers heals 45 hit points and grants us a plus one luck bonus for 30 minutes. Wow. The Rabbit Skewers require a bunch of other ingredients that are only found on the island, new to Far Harbor. Black Blood Leaf, which itself heals 15 hit points and doesn't dose us with rads. We find these growing in water much like regular Blood Leaf, but we also find a bunch of Black Blood Leaf in Aster's lab. They're all labeled Blood Leaf, but once we loot them, we get Black Blood Leaf. We can also find one Aster growing on these shelves. The skewers also require Blight. This is the glowing fungus we found growing next to that child of Adam, whom we passed on the road to Acadia. They grow on the side of trees and are easy to spot from a long distance because they glow so brightly. Like Black Blood Leaf, Blight alone heals 15 hit points and doesn't douse us with rads. It also requires lure weed, which we find growing in water. These likewise can be consumed alone, heal 15 hit points and don't douse us with rads, but we have to be careful with these because there's a creature that evolved to mimic the look of lure weed. The angler, which hides in the water, sticking its glowing stalk above the surface to lure in unsuspecting wastelanders. And finally, of course, we need rabbit. Far Harbor introduces the Rad Rabbit to the island. It's a critter, not an enemy. They don't fight back. We'll find them scattered all over the place. I often find them in the ruins of towns, but they're fast. If we don't use vats to nail them, they can be tricky to kill. On them, we find rabbit legs. They don't really look like rabbit legs. They look more like rabbit chunks. Uncooked, these heal 15 hit points, but douse us with four rads. 
Black blood leaf is also used to cook another new recipe that comes with Far Harbor, chicken noodle soup, which heals 60 hit points over time and grants us plus 55 radiation resistance for 30 minutes. These require two black blood leaf, one carrot, one chicken thigh, and one dirty water. The carrot and dirty water are not new to the game, but the chicken thigh is. Far Harbor introduces the rad chicken, which like the rad rabbit, we've got to chase down. On the rad chicken, we'll find a chicken thigh, which uncooked heals 22 hit points, but douses us with seven rads. Then there's cave fungus, which looks identical to glowing fungus. Cave Fungus was available within the base Fallout 4 game files, but it wasn't placed in the world until the Far Harbor DLC. We only find it in a few places. There are a couple scattered around the nucleus, and we find three of them placed inside a vase in High Confessor Tectus's quarters. Cave Fungus does have different stats compared to the Glowing Fungus. While Glowing Fungus grants us plus 10 hit points and douses us with 3 rads, Cave Fungus grants us plus 10 hit points but removes 10 rads. I wonder what it says about Tectus that he's the only person to have a stash of naturally occurring fungus that removes radiation. Hmm. There are a variety of new meats that we can grind up and grill up here on the island. First up is gulper innards, which we can loot from dead gulpers we kill on the island. These are the salamander-like creatures that often fall down from trees. When raw, gulper innards heal 60 hit points, but douse us with 6 rads. However, we can cook it up at a cooking station to turn it into gulper slurry. Hmm. The gulper slurry is strange in that it actually grants invisibility for 10 seconds. It doesn't restore any health. It's basically a craftable stealth boy. To craft gulper slurry, we need one acid, one crystal, three gulper innards, and one purified water. Then there's angler meat that we can find on the bodies of dead anglers. When we eat it raw, it heals 35 hit points over 10 seconds, but douses us with 10 radiation. However, we can poach it at any cooking station to create poached angler. Poached Angler heals 100 hit points and grants us plus 15 to our max action points and reduces falling damage for 20 seconds. Then Fog Crawlers drop raw Fog Crawler meat. Raw Fog Crawler heals 90 hit points and douses us with 6 radiation, but we can fry it up at a cooking station with one piece of oil to create the Fried Fog Crawler, which heals 125 hit points and greatly increases our damage resistance, but only in foggy and rainy weather for 30 minutes. <laughs> a very specific use for this one. Far Harbor introduces us to the very creative creature, the giant hermit crab. These drop hermit crab meat, which when eaten raw, heals 100 hit points, grants us a temporary bonus of plus 1 to endurance, but douses us with 25 rads. But we can grill it up at any cooking station. And grilled hermit crab heals 200 hit points and gives us a temporary bonus of plus 2 to strength and 2 to endurance for 30 minutes. Pretty cool. Wolves are new to Far Harbor, and these drop raw wolf meat. When eaten raw, they heal 20 hit points, but douse us with 8 rads. But if we grill them up to make wolf ribs, they heal 60 hit points over 10 seconds and grant us night vision at night, or when in dark interiors. However, this night vision effect doesn't really work correctly. It does work outside at night, but it only works inside during the day which is the opposite of what its description says. Additionally, the description of the cooked wolf meat says that it grants less scope sway for five minutes. However, this just doesn't work at all. The description is wrong here. Next, if we access Iris Mason's terminal inside the Vimpop factory, we find an entry called Vim Recipes. We can't read these recipes, but after downloading the recipes, we can craft all Vim beverages from any cooking station. We find that the recipe for regular Vim is one acid, one corn, one mute fruit, and one purified water. The recipe for Vim Captain's Blend is one aster, one Mirelurk meat, and one Vim. Guess Mirelurk meat is the best we can do in the absence of fiddleheads and lobster shells. The recipe for Vim Quartz is one bubblegum, one carrot, and one Vim. And the recipe for Vim Refresh is one Dandy Boy Apples, one Gourd, 
and one Vim. The Vim beverages are very interesting. Unlike Nuka-Cola, none of these Vim drinks dose us with radiation. And a regular Vim is better than a regular Nuka-Cola. A regular Nuka-Cola heals 20 hit points and heals 10 action points. A regular Vim heals 30 hit points and 10 action points. The really unique one is Vim Captain's Blend. It instantly heals 100 AP, heals 600 HP over time, removes 2 Charisma for a period of time, but sea creatures are more hesitant to attack us. And we can see the effects of this beverage at work. After drinking some Captain's Blend, if we walk up to any Mirelurk, they look at us quizzically for a bit, but they don't attack. Vim Quartz is very different from Nuka-Cola Quartz. Nuka-Cola Quartz heals 240 action points and doses us with 15 radiation. But Vim Quartz heals only 25 AP, but also heals 75 HP and grants us plus 15 to carry weight. So a great little alternative to Grilled Radstag. Finally, the Vim Refresh heals 75 HP and 52 AP, but it increases action point recovery rate, a lot like jet fuel. If we have Buddy, the walking, talking, beverage cooling robot from the Commonwealth, we can make ice cold variants of all of these Vim beverages. And an ice cold version improves the stats we get from them significantly. An ice cold Vim heals 55 hit points and 10 action points. An Ice Cold Vim Captain's Blend heals 700 hit points and 120 action points at the cost of 2 Charisma. However, it doesn't change its effect towards sea creatures. And Ice Cold Vim Quartz heals 75 hit points, 35 action points, and grants us plus 20 to carry weight for 300 seconds. And an Ice Cold Vim Refresh heals 75 hit points, 60 action points, and increases our action point recovery rate by 12 AP for 60 seconds. So if we have Buddy, it's certainly worthwhile to store Vim in a fridge for a bit. Next up is Raw Sap. We find raw sap in collection buckets nailed to the sides of trees scattered around the island. I found my first few buckets at the old pond house. The woods just outside the nucleus is another great location, but perhaps the best location to harvest raw sap is Brook's Head Lighthouse. No fewer than 13 buckets of the stuff can be found hanging from the trees around the lighthouse. If we harvest the sap, we find a new consumable called raw sap, which can be consumed raw. It heals 30 hit points over time and does not douse us with radiation but its most important use is as a crafting component for Ware's Brew. We gain access to Ware's Brew by completing Zealot Ware's Quest, The Trials of Brother Devon. Zealot Ware gives us four bottles of Ware's Brew and the recipe. Taking a look at the recipe in our Pip-Boy, Ware's Brew, three parts tree sap, boil until distilled, drink until you feel better. Huh. Who knew the sap produced by the trees on the island would cure radiation? Ware's Brew just appears like a bottle of sludge or tree sap in our inventory. Only it's got a piece of paper taped onto it that says Ware Brew. Now that we have the recipe, we can craft it at any cooking station by going to the beverages section. We find it under purified water, and it only costs three raw sap. Ware's Brew is a very useful consumable. It not only removes 100 radiation damage, that's a third of Rataway, which removes 300 radiation damage, but it also heals us for 100 hit points, which Rataway does not do. Additionally, Rataway adds fatigue on survival mode for Fallout 4, but Ware's Brew does not. The only problem is that it does weigh half a pound. That's five times more what one piece of Rataway weighs. And finally, as a reward for completing the Captain's Dance, we get the Captain's Feast. This is a unique consumable item, the only one of its kind in the game. We don't find it anywhere else, and we can't make it. The Captain's Feast just looks like a huge steak. Looks amazing. 
now I'm hungry, and it grants us a plus 10% experience gain for two hours. So it's a good one to use early on while completing quests on the island, or maybe we could use it just before turning in a bunch of quests to maximize the experience that we get from them. And with that, we've covered every new piece of loot that we can walk away with from the Far Harbor DLC for Fallout 4. We'll probably have to make quite a few trips back and forth between the island and our player home because we can loot a truckload. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching. I publish many new Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I've got a brand new shirt in the shop. Glory to Atom! If you agree with High Confessor Tectus that the people of Far Harbor must be punished for their heresy, then you can find this design on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find it on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members and patrons on Patreon are becoming increasingly important as YouTube continues to make platform changes that make the future of YouTube monetization uncertain. So to all my YouTube members and patrons on Patreon, you have my sincerest thanks. I couldn't make these videos without your help. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.